are at the Rockefeller Fountain in the Bronx Zoo with another fun episode of Art and About with Danny Halbin on BronxNet. Today we're going to soak up the autumn sun and try to uh, find a, a beautiful composition with this uh, amazing uh, Italian fountain and the backdrop of the entrance to the, to the Bronx Zoo. So um, we're going to be working in oil paints today and I just want to share the approach that I've uh, found that works for me. I prepare my oil paints at home in the, or at the studio and uh, put them all, mix them, mix a little oil with every uh, color and put them onto what's called a, uh, a folding palette. And that allows me to transport the paint without getting it too mucked up. Uh, it has a little clip in the back. And this way, when I get to my location, I figure out what I'm gonna paint, I'm able to get right started. So, in the compositional outline that we're creating, we're looking for the big shapes. You know, there's a lot of details in this scene that we're, that we're looking to depict. So, I know I am having the uh, big form of the Rockefeller fountain in our foreground. So I'm going to start with that, with the base of that fountain. And uh, it, it's a, you know, it's a circle. The fountain is a circular fountain, but because I'm seeing it from low down, it, it forms the shape of a big oval. So I'm going to start with this oval just to see if everything will fit with, with the oval being this size and in this position. It's like an experiment because you can't know how everything fits in until you start to block in more of the picture. So uh, here's my foreground and now uh, this will um, give me a reference for the next part of the fountain. So we're going to just block in very loosely the shapes, the out, outline of this fountain so that uh, we, we can see, um, you know, how it, how the rest of the picture will fit together. And now I'm going to the mid-ground, which is where the, uh, this uh, building is located. And I'm sort of, uh, you know, envisioning the relationship of one to the other, of the, the foreground shape of the fountain against the mid-ground shape of the building. So I'm going to take my time with this part of the process and really, you know, uh, make, make it clear for myself, give myself enough information to be able to make this determination about whether my, you know, composition is, is working or not. These lines are merely reference. They're just giving me a sense of how the entire surface of the canvas is going to be distributed. It's going to be broken up. Now if I want to uh, just block out some of my lights and darks, I'm going to use a, in this case, a bristle brush that I know is very sturdy and will, will hold up to uh, some vigorous brush work. As you can see, I'm really rubbing it in. I don't want to put too much paint on the canvas, but I want to cover whole areas with tone just to see, uh, reinforce my composition and see how, you know, how it all begins to, to fit together. So uh, perhaps it's time to mix a little more of the uh, brown paint with the, with the medium, with the oil. Uh, just so I have, I don't have to keep stopping, I can just, uh, and you, you may have 
seen that I maybe I didn't have the same color but it was a little on the blue side so I mix in red you know with, with paint unlike pastel where you have to pick the right colors to work with with oil it's a uh, it's much more a fluid <laughs> kind of a process where you can keep mixing your colors uh, as you go In order to make things stand out in a picture, you have to have light against dark. So you have to assign a value, a tone, along the spectrum of light and dark to, to everything you see. And so I'm kind of making a, what, what I'm calling a, a tonal underpainting first, which means that I'm using just one color to assign, ultimately assign everything in my picture uh, a value. And then when I can see how that's working, then I can start to use color. But it's amazing how much you can do just with one color. It's really wonderful. So for example, uh, my statue is here in the foreground it has all these shapes, but what distinguishes them is where the light is hitting them. They're very bright and they're standing out against the uh, darker backdrop of the trees. So I'm going to use the darkness of these trees to silhouette the shapes of the fountain in the foreground. So this is the head of, the, of one of the uh, seahorses and the knee of the, uh, of the seahorse, and the, the knee, the leg of the cherub. And so again, as we, without getting too crazy into detail, but as we examine each part of the picture more closely, we can define it using these techniques of light against dark, large against small, focus against diffusion. There's a, a real balance of opposites that we're working with. Another tool that uh, one can use for um, sort of pulling out smaller uh, details of light is the edge of your uh, palette knife or the back of your brush where you can, well, the palette knife might work better, or I also have a uh, scalpel. So if I want to, you know, instead of just using the rag, I can pull out my lights using the edge of my scraper. So now that I'm <clears throat> pretty comfortable with the arrangement of things with my compositional outline, <clears throat> I'm going to actually mix some color and block in some color. And uh, the first color that I'm working with is going to be the, uh, the brilliant green of the grass uh, because I have a large, I have a couple of large shapes uh, that will, um, you know, serve to strengthen my composition uh, of, of grassy green areas. So the first is this um, <clears throat> line that circles the, the grass that's circling around the fountain. So I have to identify where the top of my fountain is. I'm just going to highlight that with the edge of my the edge of my scraper. And then there's another area of flowers that's coming from there and let's see this is right so i'm going to block in i'm going to mix a liberal amount of my oil so that i can stretch out my paint you know, it can be pretty thin at this point. You don't want to get too thick. 
but uh, thick enough where you could really see the color. One thing that we tune into as artists is the pattern of things in the world. And, and one pattern that's defining my composition is the circular pattern. Here it is in the grassy area. Then again, in this, I'll, just for uh, illustration's sake, I'll assign my flower area uh, uh, an orangey color, uh, orangey yellow color, just to, to show what I'm, illustrate what I'm saying. Um, so we have another pattern, another reinforcement of our uh, <clears throat> oval with this, the way that these uh, orangey flowers are bending around the fountain. Okay, the next shape uh, that we're, I'm gonna work with that uh, reinforces the concentric oval pattern that I'm talking about is the edge of the fountain itself. And it's the uh, part of the um, <clears throat> cement form that forms the outer uh, edge of the, the uh, pool that holds the water. So I'm just gonna block in that dark area against the, the light flowers below. And that's a curved form uh, that gives way to the light, uh, the, the, the curve of that shape that's uh, catching the light. So, so as I'm uh, making this mark, this light mark around the fountain, top of the fountain, with my soft round brush, I'm realizing that it's kind of not, you know, I'm not controlling it the way I'd like to. So. I picked a bristle brush, and you can see how much easier this is to control that stroke, to control your area of light. So, as Mr. Natural says, use the right tool for the job. Have a variety of brushes. Have, a, have your colors handy. You know, work in all kinds of materials so that you can really uh, tune in to what, what materials work best for you and what approach to using those materials feels right to you. So I'm only human and my tendency is the same as everyone else's. I see this circular form and I just want to refine it and fine tune it and blend it and control it and of course I have to try to resist that although it's so tempting to get into the all of the you know the fun part of the process um, but I'm going to resist I'm going to go back to the big picture and uh, there's another concentric ring in my oval pattern, and now this is the road that's beyond the uh, grassy uh, lawn that's surrounding the fountain. This is my little road that in reality has cars on it, but that I'm leaving out for the sake of art. So especially when you start using the full color of the paint and using the paint more thickly, uh, if you start to make changes, you may want to scrape away or rub away with a rag uh, the areas that you uh, want to change. So for, the, for example, uh, now I'm seeing that, the, uh, that in this lawn area, there's actually a statue sticking up so instead of painting on top of the green paint, I uh, 
have learned from experience that to keep my colors clean, it's better to get rid of the green paint. And then if I want to put in a completely different color, I can do it without worrying that it's going to mix too much with the paint that you already have. And you'll notice that as the process continues and the work progresses, the density, the thickness of the paint increases. You, they call it loading up the brush. At first I start very thin and very tonal and then I start blocking out my accents and eventually I'm using full color with less oil and more of a pigment to oil ratio that will cover the, the uh, canvas and give you a, uh, a intensity of, of richness and color that oil can provide. Um, so this, the paint I'm using now is thicker, uh, richer than what I started with before. Hello, hello. Hey, hey John. How are you? Very good well. To see you. Good to see, good to see, see you. you. Hey, here's Don Calvalli. How executive. are you, man? How are you doing? He's what the, brings you here? Oh, well, <laughs> um, this fountain is what's brought me Absolutely. here. And um, perhaps as the executive Vice President of the, Conserv of the Wildlife Conservation Society. You could tell us a little about this fountain. The history of this fountain is fascinating because it speaks to our Italian heritage, but really also to America and this idea of bringing some of the best of Europe and classic architecture and fountains to the United States. Um, the story here is that uh, a gentleman named Biagio Catella was the, was the individual who actually made this fountain Ooh. in 1872 oh, wow. for the city of Como, Italy. And all things Italian, the minute the fountain was uh, completed, there was a crisis and there was a controversy around the fountain because uh, there was a group, the Fontanisti and the Anti-Fontanisti, <laughs> the people who liked the fountain and the people who didn't like the fountain. And the reason why was there was a very, very small aqueduct on Mount Olimpino that was being used for the water. And therefore, once they built the fountain, it lowered the water pressure in the rest of the area. So when they finished the fountain, literally people living a little bit up in the hills around Como uh, could not get water. So after less than 20 years, the fountain ended up being uh, put in the uh, garage or in actually in the uh, city hall. And this fountain remained in wow. city hall until uh, a gentleman, uh, Mr. Baumgarten, uh, found this fountain, reached out to the Rockefeller family that, Ooh. as you know, was very involved in the Como area and uh, said, would you like to buy the fountain? Well, it's and a shame for them, but uh, what, a, what a, a boon for, for us here in, in the Bronx. In 1902, the amazing. fountain was purchased and for $25,000, uh, which was a lot of money at the time, was shipped here to the Bronx uh, and to the zoo. And I've got to tell you, the, the Rockefellers obviously gave this incredible gift to, uh, to New York City and to the Bronx Zoo. So hopefully this yeah, program I hope and the so. work that you're doing uh, is gonna help That's tell New it. Yorkers about this incredible piece of, uh, of their collective history. Okay, thank you, John. I'm Take care, man. Bye-bye. Full of paint. Good luck. Okay. I think often as urban dwellers, we, don't, uh, we aren't aware of the qualities, the, the subtle changes of light in the different seasons and the time of day. But as an artist, once you spend a day like this in the sun, in the park, watch the, the different way that the foliage glistens during the course of a day and feel the, the way, the different way that the, the air flows and, the, and the, just the subtlety of the splashing sound of the water and the sea lions in the distance. It uh, opens up a whole new world and that's, that's a wonderful thing. So it's not just painting, it's uh, developing a greater appreciation for life and the world around us. So I'm loading up my brush 
with a lot of thick paint so it covers the green that's below, so it's nice and rich. So you may have noticed that I've focused uh, primarily on this uh, middle ground area for quite a while. Um, possibly because uh, of the complicated, I've been avoiding the complicated fountain, but so now I, I'm going to try to focus in and work out some of the, the basic forms of the fountain once again. When you're copying a work of art, it's more important to uh, stick to the, at least the, the general forms. Like, I, you know, I, I'm dealing with uh, figurative elements in this picture, even though they're not people, they're uh, mermen and mermaids and cherubs, but they still have human proportions. And whenever you're dealing with the face or the figure, you uh, need to measure things more and, and put things in, in uh, you know, some general sense of, of human proportion. So here I'm going to define this arm by blocking out the background a little bit more, the negative space around it. I'm using the, the kind of brownish gray of the fountain color to give greater definition to the form. And looking for every opportunity to clarify that there's a, one shape in front of another. One way is with these strong highlights and the strong contrast of the highlights against the darker backdrop. Water is a fascinating subject to work with. It's um, one of the kinetic elements. It's moving. Hey, emerging out of this fountain is none other than Michael Max Nasby. How you doing, Danny? Executive Director of the Bronx Net Television Station. Got some water? Huh. Rescuing me in my okay. bright, sunny afternoon. Thank you, sir. I do. really you know, appreciate it. It's a physical it's activity. Fine. It's a spiritual activity. It's it a is. metaphysical activity. It's, and it's a schwitzing activity. <laughs> Looking good, Danny. All right, thank you, sir. <clears throat> Always remember, if you're going to go out and spend a day in the sun, bring a hat. Bring pl plenty of water, an umbrella if you can rig it up or position yourself in the shade, uh, sunscreen if you're fair skinned. These are the key ingredients to uh, spending a happy and healthy day in the, in the, in this case, in the beautiful autumn light of the Bronx Zoo. Okay, well I think we've got a pretty good start today. And I'm hoping that you can see from this uh, kind of uh, expressionistic beginning that we, uh, you know, where I can go in the, in the days to come when I'm coming back here to the, to the Bronx Zoo. Join us again for another exciting and fun-filled episode of Art and About with Danny Haub and on BronxNet.